Good yeah. stuff. Well, good evening, um, ladies and gents, and welcome to this first um, Lanks and Trenches to the Tour uh, seminar. I'm Adrian Fryer, if you don't know me folks from Liverpool Golf Centre. Um, bit of a dinosaur, but um, I just thought we wanted to do something during this C19 period, which looks like it's potentially going to end for golf if you're not at a golf range or what have you at the moment. So welcome to it this evening. Um, just from a kind of um, point of view of the format, I've muted everybody. I will invite a couple of people in for uh, questions, namely our captain, Mr. Neil Lancashire PJ captain, Neil Reeves, and our secretary, Andy Duncan. We've also got a couple of questions from John Twistle and so on. There is a chat feature as well. On depends on what format you're using. I can't promise I'll be able to totally monitor that whilst we are um, in full flow. But if you do, I will aim to answer those questions um, towards the end or whatever. We've got a good a good hour or so, I hope. And um, I hope you um, you're going to enjoy it. Uh, as the title, the names and the, the, the clues in the name from the trenches to the tour. And really, we want to chronicle and ask Dave and Simon the, their journeys to playing on tour and coaching on tour. And obviously, David enjoying a lot of um, success. So, can you, are you there, Dave, uh, Simon? You can hear me okay? Yes, mate, I'm there. Great stuff. And David? Yeah, absolutely right. I can hear you. Great stuff. So we'll switch view, folks, because we're in a meeting seminar as opposed to um, a, um, a webinar. Uh, I am recording this um, as well, so ultimately we'll be able to redistribute it. Um, and once we've um, edited it and taken out all the swear words and what have you. <laughs> so yeah, if I may, I'm going to just do a little bit a bio, a potted history of the two guys. And, and, and I, again, I can reiterate... I'm most grateful to them both giving their time. We've got a great lineup of speakers over the coming weeks as well, um, but they're giving their time freely, and um, as is their nature, and really do really do appreciate that. So we're talking for Simon first of all, the Welsh wizard. I was assistant pro at Wrexham, and I think I played with him a little bit when he was there. Then went on to be club pro at Carden Park and Clays, and then ultimately Windermere. Obviously, anybody or you guys, girls from the North region, will know Simon's uh, playing prowess. He's topped the North region order of merit three times. He's won countless pro ams. He's the Leeds Cup winner. He also has won the, the um, overseas North region pro am. And I have to say, that particular was a sterling effort at Monty Ray with rounds of 69, 67, 65, 69. So he's 19 under and blew the field away by nine shots, which is um, no mean feat. He's also represented club professionals three times in 03 and 05 at the Clay Club when they were victorious, and 2011 at San Fran. Um, played two Open Championships, 2010 St Andrews and 2011 at Sandwich when Clark won. And obviously that gives you a real without me going on forever. The guy can play, there's no doubt about that. And of course, now his career has progressed into the MENA tour, as well as refereeing and obviously um, coaching um, David. So I don't think, I, I'm, not, I'm not left too much out there, hopefully, Simon. But, um, I, think you've done, I think you've done quite, I feel quite good about myself now, to be honest. And Dave. just, just before think, yeah. your head gets too big, I, I can remember having a conversation, I won't mention, but with an ex-European tour player and winner, chatting who'd played with you one day. And I'd, I think you'd been over to see me and we talked about the swing and whatever you had. I'd, I'd probably ruined you. And he'd played with you and he said to me, he said I've, it was the greatest display of ball control he'd ever seen. You know, we we're talking about you as a player. I said, "What did you think?" And he, and he, and that was unsolicited. He said, "It was, it was awesome." So, you take note of that, David. Just you know. Oh, I've seen it many times. Well, don't worry. So, David, about yourself, sir. Um, Saint Helens lad. Obviously now. Ormskirk. Ormskirk. Again. Ormskirk. Well, Ormskirk. Like that. Is exactly where you there. Fifty. Yeah. Obviously, I know what was unusual for yourself is you took golf up, I say, relatively late, 10 years old. And I think when we chatted briefly, eight handicap when you started, when Arthur Kirkby took you under his wing as a YTS lad, if the older folks can remember what a YTS 
scheme was a job creation scheme and gave you a kind of chance for a year to see how you, you went on. And obviously, that obviously worked out. And then Jack Hammond, um, the professional who's still there, Jack inherited you as part of the deal of him taking the job. And um, again, you've gone on to great uh, playing uh, career. We know you've run about 200 events, I would say, pro-ams and, and, and so on. You again represented pros in the PGA Cup team 2011 at San Fran and played at the Open in 1998, the one that O'Meara won, but obviously many of us remember the Open where Justin Rose um, pitched in on the last there at Birkdale. You also played at Carnoustie in uh, 2007. I think what was a particular note there, if I remember rightly, you shot 62 in the qualifying um, round Monifee, which is some score. Of course, played in the PGA Championship in 97, 04 and 08. And um, then obviously gone on to your seniors um, uh, record where you qualified for the tour in 18, 2018, got your seniors card and promptly won the Russian Open after eight starts, which is fantastic. And then, of course, went on into 2019 to win back to back in the um, Sinclair International and the Paris Legends. So again, obviously, both of you can play the game. There's no doubt about that. So if we can cut to you, first of all, Simon. You know, how have you, can we just ask you, first of all, how did you manage um, combining a playing career with a club pro's job? I think it was always a balancing act. And one that at times I was quite good at and at times I wasn't very good at. Um, I always wanted to be a, a player. I always wanted to be a coach. Um, I enjoyed both aspects at the same time, you know, so yes. I was playing and coaching as well as um, having, you know, club job responsibilities. Uh, mm. The the job I had with at, at Carden Park was just the perfect job because it was basically a, a coaching and playing position working for Jack Nichols Golf Schools. Mm. And that was just uh, just perfect, but it's it's tough for anybody in the industry, um, and certainly now I think where everybody's starting to specialise a lot more. Um, I hold my hands up to the guys who are you know in club jobs. I've been out the club job now for a couple of years, and I really have an awful lot of respect for the guys that are doing it day in day out and servicing the members. You know, I've got a great a great job now at. A great attachment at Preston Golf Club with Andrew Greenbank, and I just go down and coach and, and help him out, and it's you know it's a perfect scenario for me when I'm home. Great stuff. And in terms of your aspirations as a, a player, you know, obviously you 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 were or are were a club pro and an assistant pro and so on. Did you? Always, I mean, most of us come into it wanting to be players, and obviously, some of us realise we can, we're not quite as good as we thought we were. But you could obviously play the game. But as you say, were you, did you have any particular heroes you were you influenced by, or any bosses or people you thought, uh, you know, I want to emulate him? And it was more, as I say, the, the playing side as opposed to teaching or, or coaching. It was always it was always playing, and then it evolved into coaching. Um, I've always been a great historian of the game and, you know, from Snead to Hogan, you know, you study those guys and then when we grew up as kids, it was Faldo, Nick Price, that era and obviously Seve, Alathabal with the great Ryder Cup teams of 85, 87, 89. You were yeah. watching those guys play. I think it was a more European-based and UK-based or role models at that point because we never, we, we didn't really get a lot of PJ Tour golf on TV apart from, you know, the majors and Greg Norman, you know, came along and, you know, Greg Greg was great. And then, you know, when I, I, I started out and I turned pro after a, a decent amateur career, um, I went down the assistant pro route like everybody does, earning 25 quid a week and working all the hours God sends and trying to practice outside your shift times and everything else. And then from that point of view, we... Um, we got to a... Has he gone? <laughs> He's had enough of me no, already. Here. No, I'm here. I'm, I'm here, sir. There's no, no problem. You're fine, fine. yeah. <laughs> and and to, just going back to your, your coaching there, you say, and, and you're influenced by people and you you studied Sneed and so on and so forth. Of course, now we live in an era where uh, we've got an abundance of information 
in, you know, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and all the sort of things, Sky TV and great reviews and so on. Was your, did you feel that you learned your craft more through self-discovery, playing, you know, hitting golf balls, or were you picking other players' brains or reading stuff? I mean, obviously now the education department within the PGA is fantastic, you know, in terms of shaping young, young pros and so on. But how, how was your kind of, and now to this day, do you still study stuff or is it more, if I can call it old school, John Jacobs ball flight or are you, are you into tech? I'm into everything. Um, I'm into tech. I'm into ball flight. I'm into, you know, the mind, how people's minds work. And our job, Adrian, as you know, is about helping people. And yes. Different people have different learning styles. They have different personality styles. They have different goals in, within the game. I mean, I was very lucky when I joined Jack Nicklaus Golf Schools in 97 um, that I was, uh, I got exposed to a gentleman called Jim Flick, who a lot of yes, people of course, will yeah. heard of and on the webinar, but probably won't have heard of. And Jim was just an astonishing, astonishing mentor. And I worked for him mm. for four years and he with his staff he um he always used to send us out to watch great coaches coach so i yes. spent time with lad and i spent time with um, jim mclean and butch and, and those guys yeah and then through the playing i got exposed to a lot of great coaches um bob torrance mm -hmm. and, and one of my personal favorites and i still watch a lot of his stuff now it was at the 2011 Open at um, St George's when I played with Bubba in, and Kevin Streelman in, in one of the practice rounds and Sean Foley walked around for 18 holes and I was more interested in talking to Sean than I was actually worrying about where I was hitting it. He, I mean, right. he's the most fascinating guy I've ever, I've ever, yes, ever he's spoken very, to. He's yeah, an very, absolute very genius. Good. The man's a genius. So from my, my coaching standpoint, I still read a lot. I watch a lot of stuff online. I watch, you know, webinars. I watch all, all sorts of great stuff just so I can communicate the message to pretty much everybody. I, I've got somebody, to, something to give everyone. I think that is the, the main thing. You're trying, you know, you, you've, you've got a broad, a broad spectrum of knowledge there, as you say. And I mean, obviously, if you've mixed with the likes of Jim Flick and Jim McLean and Butch Arm and those guys, wrote the book you know they were kind of um, pioneers if you like in particularly in the US and you know we've ultimately followed and you know Jim Flick and Tusky and those guys obviously spent a lot of time with John Jacobs from your point of view with David and obviously I'm going to speak to David about this but how does that coaching relationship work are you big into stats are you big into tech or is it more phone or more watching and ball flight and um, in terms of kind of interaction between the two of you I'd love to be into stats, but he won't keep them. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, lo I'd love to have some data, but he just won't. He, he just doesn't keep them. So <laughs> it is, but again, that's potentially part of knowing the um, the and player I, you're it, dealing with. Absolutely, um, and, you know, if I if I you know harped on and harped on about him about keeping keeping data, it would just be a very very short relationship. I have other players who love <laughs> keeping data. And, you know, I get data all the time, which is fantastic, you know, but it's all about different people and it, different people learn different ways, want to do it different ways. And we've got to adapt to that as coaches. So would it be fair to say you're kind of seeing yourself as not just, should we say, a swing coach, but more a performance coach that you're looking at the whole package with him um, and, a, and a support system, possibly emotionally when, when things aren't going well and... Uh, and, and so on, or going, or they are going well in terms of kind of conversations you ha you have with him. I mean, our dynamic is different because we've known each other for twenty years, mm. probably probably more, and we played against each other. We played together in P uh, in the PJ Cup, Cup and, and, and mm. had a whale of a time, and played some seriously good golf while we were at it. Um, you know, we had a, an informal relationship. You know, when we were you know, when we were both playing together, that it was just coming out of a give me 10 minutes, give me 10 minutes. And it was, it was always fine. And I used to, I used to try some stuff out on him as well. And he, he, he might tell you the story about Bruff. In, uh... <laughs> 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 yeah, later on. He Are you going to tell it or is he going to tell it? 
No, I, I think I think I'll leave that to uh, to the great man to tell to tell that story. Uh, <laughs> great but stuff. It's the one thing you know that we do. It's with, with David. You know, he's a great friend, and I've got a genuine interest in him as I have in everybody else. It's it's about developing them not as players but as people as well. Uh, I think that's the that's the huge thing. And you know, these kids that are coming up, the, the young ones now that are coming up. They, it's it's an it's an odd situation because they are they're exposed to so much information but don't particularly have a plan. We've always had a plan. I think that's the the big one to, to have a plan, knowing where Dad is, but knowing where A is, where you've got to start. Okay, a couple of questions uh, uh, for you, and I, I'm going to read some of these as we um, <coughs> as we, we we go along. But uh, one from. Andy Duncan, and I'm going to just unmute Andy and I'll wake him up. And um, <laughs> can you hear me, Andy? I can hear you. Good stuff. This is our secretary of the Lancashire PGA, and just asking, well, I'd like you, you know, you can remember your question, I hope. Just about. If you yeah, like it's about really, it. it's, it's to the pair of them, and it's, it's to do with sort of like um, when you got on tour, David, because I've, I've, I've spoken to a few guys who've been on tour, they always seem to find it's there's a sort of change in how they are. Was there a particular area of your game that sort of you found strengthened when you got on tour without really sort of naturally? Um, was there an area that you, that you thought, well, you know, that sort of came on from being on tour? Was it, was it, was it, was it something that came along for you as a player? Did you find it? It was an area that really strengthened yeah. up. Uh, well, I mean, I always found um, when, when I mean, I played the region and everything else, even at that time when I was doing well regionally and all the rest of it, when we'd go overseas to the, to the you know, the Portuguese programs and all the rest of it, I would, I would play well, but I very rarely felt like I was, I would walk as well as I would at home. If they, um, and I used to just basically always come home and say, I can't put on them greens. I can't, I can do grey and I can't do, I can't chip, I can't do this. And for me, I think that would probably in the back of my mind when I went out on the tour, um, I realised straight away I have to work out how, how actually, how do I chip like I can chip and put on, on the different surfaces. So. I, I just put loads and loads of time into it. I, I, I and just you have to ad adapt a little bit for the different grasses and things. And I've, I've looked at reading grain, but half the time I give up and just hit it where I think. I mean, I, I, you know, Simon said before I'm, the technical side of it and jotting things down and mapping things out that's no use to me. It just confuses me. Um, I just, you know, I've, I spend a lot of time around the greens. Really, was was my big difference I think um, when, I, when, I, when I went out on tour you know um, because I would, like I say I would come back from Portugal programs and stuff and think well, you know and I was lucky enough to win quite a few but you think I could have won that by miles if I'd done you know around the greens a little bit better and all the rest of it I, I honestly didn't know when I put it well on courses why I put it well on them when I was abroad uh, and to be honest I think probably it was down to the Maybe there's less grain in them, but I mean, I didn't understand grain other than it was shiny and dark. That's it. Um, so I, I, the, the more complicated and the more things I have to try and factor in in my head, particularly around the grain, I think a siren will probably back up. Basically, ruins me. So um, I have to work out work out a simple technique to, did, to adapt. And, and I think, think obviously this is your style of, of play. Sorry, Andy, please. Can you? Well, I was just going to reiterate, was it something that you you noticed when you went out there, this sort of short game area? Was The guys yeah. were, were hot on that as well, were they? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I, I sort of touched on it with a chat with Adrian the other day, a, a lot of the lads out on, on the tour have been out on tour all the careers. So, so they've, that, 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 that's the norm to them going to Spain then going to Portugal to Germany to the Far East to wherever it might well be uh, so they're used to 
all the different types of grasses and the different techniques and styles and I, and obviously I am not, not that great I wasn't that greatly traveled prior to the tour um, but uh, there's certain sort of methods you think, yeah well you know I'm using it all, but you know it's whatever works for yourself and I spend a lot of time picking out what's me what of consistent way of getting a, a, a a judgeable result, if you like, out of the types of grass at the set course, because I'm learning courses every time we go, or I was doing. We, we are now returning to one or two, but I, I, I've factored in that more than anything, really. I mean, obviously, to me, hitting the ball and the swing and the stuff we work on shouldn't change wherever you are in the world, because it's a golf ball and a golf club. Um, but the grass around the greens so taking was the that big difference on it. Taking that um, forward, Dave, and we've got a lot of few questions coming in, and also um, I've got some for you as well, Simon. But be, before I deal with a few of those, just take going you, yourself back to as assistant at Ormskirk and, and then Mossack and so on, and being attached and playing around the, 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 the wastelands of the north and it being cold. Do you think the tougher conditions, and maybe even say somewhere like Ormskirk, a narrow golf course? Number one, how that shaped you. And then also your inspirations. I know Jack gave you a lot of encouragement and we spoke the other day about, you know, Mike Slater, the late Mike Slater, the late great Mike Slater, mm -hmm. who's obviously another senior to offer, but a local character that many of the guys and the girls in the room will know of. And, and maybe you're influenced by people like Paul Eels and Affleck and Houston and ultimately Arch and Jamie Johnson, all those people. How, how did that shape your... I know, obviously, mentally, I would, you probably class that as one of being your big strengths, you know, your resilience and... and yeah, and that, is, yeah. That, that is, 100%, that, that is. I, I mean, I would, uh, I would be amazed if, uh, if throughout the time that I've ever started playing the game, anyone's gone, oh, he's got a lovely swing, you know. But, I mean, it's not about... It's, it's results. Um, and and between the years and and the determination and it, determination isn't everything. Of course, it's not. I mean, you can be as determined as you want, but if you can't do it, you've you've got to combine the two. Um, and when I started, um, old Arthur, bless him, when, when I first went there, he was very much a Hogan man, um, yeah. and uh, he gave me the Modern Fundamentals, the book, which I still have to this day, actually. Um, Fantastic. And he basically said to me, if I could have written a golf book, that would have been it. Uh, and that's how I was taught. And okay, then Jack so you... came along and changed, changed it a little, a bit, bit more modern. And, but, you know, I listened a lot to Jack. Um, and he was, he was, he pushed me a lot. You know, he, he, he sort of said to me, you, you need to play a lot more. Um, and, he probably, in, in fairness, probably had more belief in me than I had, if I'm honest. I mean, I, I always had it in my head, but he, he pushed mm. me to play more. And with, with um, you know, you, you played just like Simon, and we don't want to forget him, but obviously you played the PGA Championship, the PGA Cup team, and the Open mm. Championship. How much being around those competitors did you think, well, hang on a minute, I like the taste of this, or I'm as good as these folk, or I, I could be here, I should be here. Oh, yeah. How much was that an influence and a, a, an inspiration yeah, to you? Yeah, I mean, I think Simon has said the same, and I think any of the lads listening or who've done it in in, uh, in the region or the county or whatever, it, it's, it's an amazing experience. Um, the first one always, I would say, would tends to be a bit of a blur. Um, because all of a sudden you're in the middle of something that you've basically only ever seen on a TV screen. But uh, if you if you take positives out of it, because it's very difficult, very few people will go into something thrust straight in and, and produce because it's the, the pressure's ramped up so high. But but yeah, you come away from it thinking this is I want to do that. That's what I want to be. I want to be like that. Um, obviously, it's a lot harder. Than just talking about it but it, it, if, if that stays in your mind and you never lose that then taste for it you know you've come out you've come away with something absolutely yeah you, you've got to have a dream and you know if, if it doesn't if, if it makes your dream feel less 
sort of romantic and more achievable, then it's done something for you. And, yeah. and then if you're learning off what you're watching, and if you've if you've got the nerve to go and talk to people, I mean Simon has Simon does it all the time. He's it's all to anybody. Don't bother him. Um, not and that's why he works for them. You know, yeah. and these people do want to offer offer, offer information to you. You know, quite I, often. I just I just think man, you've you've got to go and ask the questions to people who have done stuff that you haven't done. And on if, that note, do you think? Yeah, um, yeah. Yourself, David, the, the co obviously you've been adversaries for many years and played with each other, but kind of citing someone like Gary Player, who's obviously quite evangelical in his thoughts, but he said, well, I don't want a lesson, a lesson off anybody who can't beat me. And I, I get that mentality. However, there's been some fantastic coaches over the years who have not made it as players. They wanted to be players and maybe that journey has made them understand the swing more or search more. The frustrated want-to-be's. But... That relationship with you two, obviously, David, you've got the utmost respect. Well, you've both got respect for each other, but you know that this guy's done it kind of at a high standard and that gives you confidence in, I, I, I take it, in, in, in what he's oh, working on. I mean, we, we, spent, uh, we spent years battering heads on the region. Um, he's, he's, um, incidentally, we... he's 50 next year and he said he's going to kick your backside know. again. Well, I know he says no, but he should, yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think I could room with him and put up with the snoring anymore. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, we, we, we had the utmost respect both ways. You know, we both, the, the, the thing, the, the respect I had is sort of double for me because um, I would never have ever classed myself as a, as a swing guru you know, we're a, a, a mega coach or anything. I, I can understand the golf swing course I can, but yeah. not to the extent that I felt that Simon knew, even when we were playing against each other, it, it was mm -hmm. he would be a good man to ask if yes. I was ever struggling. And as he said to me, uh, as he said to you, sorry, before, in the course of a season, and we were rooming together most times when we were staying away, um, yeah. I have five minutes, ten minutes here, and that, that's all it ever took with me. But he worked that out. That, that he worked a way out how I thought about golf, if you like. So it was, it was a fairly simplified sort of, you know, thought process, if you like. But he would offer me the, the advice when we were both still trying to beat each other, and many yeah, times he still... helped me, give me a tip exchange, yeah, a, a friend, a friendly rivalry. Just at this point, if I may, yeah, it's but let, if, let me just interject there, mate. I didn't want to beat him when he was playing bad. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> when he was on top of his game. When he, I'll be, I was always going to beat him when he was on top of his game. That's why I helped him. <laughs> exactly. But I think for both of you, you're obviously both highly competitive creatures, which I'm going to come to particularly with yourself, um, David, with your other sports that you're um, very good at which we'll hopefully get a chance to cover in a minute. I just want to bring in John Twistle, if I may. And um, John, if you're there. Yeah. Did you give me a... Yeah, good. And I know you've got a question about the guy's strengths and also kind of nature versus nurture. And Yeah, a couple of questions. Firstly, Ed, Shaq, thanks for your time, lads. Uh, appreciate it. And AD, uh, thanks to you, mate, for your time and effort putting this together. Welcome. I know it's not been easy. A steep learning curve for you. <laughs> um, you kind of sort of asked me first question, which was basically the same question to both the guys. What do you feel, as in golfing terms, your strengths are? Um, like I say, you just kind of asked Dave that one. Uh, how about you, Ed? As a player or as a coach? Well, let's do both. I mean, what, do, what, what do you feel about your own golf that you were, was, let's say, good at and same with your coaching? I was, always, I was always half decent hitting it one way. I was never multidimensional. I mean, I was always okay hitting it left to right. If there was wind off the left and there was trouble at the right, just, I might as well have just written a seven down on the tee because I could just couldn't hold a ball up into the wind. And I can do it on the range and I can do it with 
with Dave on the range and it draws and I get out on the golf course and I can't see it. My strength was always short game. I always putted, I was always a great putter, still am. And short game was always really, really good. And I used to hold putts for fun. Um, TV going there and... Um, yeah, somebody's something. TV's going. Oh, sorry, mate. Yeah. I know you can multitask. Yeah, well, well done, you... Twiz. There's no, there's no football on, Twiz. It's Coronation <laughs> Street. Yeah. Oh. And I think, I think the strength as a coach is, is twofold. You know, my job is, is to get these guys and to get everybody down to zero mistakes. That's my whole deal is right. the less mistakes they make. It's not, to me, it's not about making them consistent. It's having a lack of variability. So reducing is, error. It's reducing the errors. And, and you get as close to zero mistakes on any given day as a player, you're going to play great. On, and on that way, note, um, Simon, if I may, there's a few questions coming in. I've got one from Dave Corsby about... And he I've might got another missed. one here, Adrian. Go on. <laughs> Go on. Uh, a bit, little bit deeper, really. What's what's the lad's opinion on uh, the nature versus nurture topic? Go on, Jack. Don't ask me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost me about the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> well, ba basically, if you haven't got it, can you be taught it? Well, do you know, do you think I would even remotely from, from like playing again? Yeah, the only thing I would liken to that, if you like, perhaps not quite on that, that extreme, but quite often um, I noticed, because I, I mean, we all watched the tour, we all wanted to be on the tour, we all wanted to, to be successful. I, I don't think anyone doesn't when they first start. But uh, I, I used to think, you get your superstars that come along and, and that's just natural, of course it is, and, yeah. and they, stand, they stand out. But quite often, the, the guys that were touted as the next best this, that and the other. It was the ones that were underneath that, that, that weren't all, you know, loaded up and flashy. They were the ones that had the long longevity on tour and kept the cards. And, and I think there's a, there's a massive part of that. I mean, and I know who wants to be a journeyman pro. Well, I would have been. I'd have loved 25 years on the European tour. You know, and if you get a few wins in there on the way, brilliant. But not everyone can be superstars. There's not many of them. And there are to I copy. I think to answer your question, Twist, about the nature versus nurture, I think there has to be a, to start with a degree of natural ability. I think you can nurture natural ability to make people as good as they can conceivably be. The one thing that, that we see, and we've all seen it, is these talented kids that don't work hard. And there's a great phrase, the hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And it's more about the work ethic with a modicum of talent rather than having a load of talent and no work ethic. And, you know, Dave's got, you know, both. He's got talent and an incredible, you know, work ethic to go with it, which is great. Thank you. Can cheers, I um, thank, thank that answer your question there, John? Yeah, and, cheers, uh, thank, thank you thank very you. much. Um, I just want to press on. I said there have been some questions about um, what stats you do uh, and so on, and we kind of covered that earlier, that you kind of fairly simplistic approach, shall we say, but David and and, and yourself, Simon, in terms of preparation for, for practice rounds, and I do want to get on to your seniors tour um, career and obviously how that, that's blossomed, but we spoke briefly about your kind of practice elements with one of your colleagues, Paul Streeter, uh, Dave, uh, yeah. the kind of little things you do kind of, should we call it, simulating game-like conditions in modern terms. There's a lot of stuff in the industry about random practice versus block practice and so on. But, uh, you know, I believe most people have hit millions of golf balls at a flag or a tree, but we're kind of in a driving range mentality now where probably many of us in the meeting are more old school, hit a few drivers at the end because you didn't want to pick them up, but you hit a load of seven irons at a tree and so on. But how does your preparation, how has that evolved going into the seniors tour and so on and, and your, your practice rounds and uh, pre-game practice yeah, this I mean, time and we, well we, we I mean I obviously I tend to try and do work on what, what me and Simon do together away from the tour you know and then there's a sort of a slight mentality of 
I don't really work too hard on technique when I'm at an event. But at the same time, I've found over the two years when we've either Simon's actually been out there or we've spoken on the phone. I mean, generally, Simon knows that if I'm not ringing, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Um, but if I do ring him, he knows. I, I'm confident enough that he will help me midweek or mid mid tournament, even as it were. But and I, Ken, I know when we good. we spoke the other day, you spoke, and I know I'm going slightly off piece, but you you spoke about a phone call before you you um, a particular event where oh, you then that turned the things around. You felt. Yeah, yeah, it's. Um, it's the best visit to a tour I've ever had. To be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just I was, I messaged him just to say what are you doing next week? Are you busy? Because um, I was struggling after the I practiced and to be honest, the weather was awful. So it was you know a standard on a range and hitting balls. It, it, as we all know, you know when it's blowing thirty mile an hour, you, ordinarily you wouldn't go and hit any balls unless you absolutely had to. Um, so, that, so you sort of gradually through the space of the week started to lose a lot of feel and connection and what you were doing because you were just fighting elements every day um, to a point where you'd come off and think, I'm not wasting my time out there. But the forecast was to, to remain that way all week. So I played the first day and uh, I played with Stephen Dodd, who's a good mate, of both of us actually. Um, we're talking about the Russian event, are we? No, I'm talking about oh, right, Scotland. Scotland, yeah, yeah. And, um, Scotland, yeah. I, I, I just basically, when I thought I was hitting it well, it was still miles behind him, and I know he's a long hitter, but yeah, it was it was obscene. Um, and I just so I just messaged Dad to say, "What are you doing next week?" Um, and I was I just happened to be in the bathroom, and I turned the phone went, So what you, what's the matter? What's this? And, it, and we just he asked me what was happening on the golf course. I didn't tell him I, my opinion. We just told him what was happening and you know he came up with a drill for me to try and it just went oh that's it was like the light bulb went on and, and that's the kind of way we work anyway we've started on, with a plan that, that on that came note, up uh, Simon you're really kind of more reacting to kind of describing what the ball did rather than say what my say my swing's doing or this is what's going on on the golf course and and, but, and, and you yeah I mean, under tournament side. conditions as, as we all know you know, there is only one outcome that you're actually interested in is where the ball's going and how many times you're actually hitting it. Yeah. And, you know, with my, with, with David and, and with my other players, hopefully I have a, a good enough knowledge of their, their games and, and their ball flights to be able to give them a, a simple drill or a, a simple mental idea or anything to, to get them on track for that week to be able to pull out a result no matter what the result is you know and they Dave's very receptive to drills and feelings as well that's the big thing but I don't think you you said something quite interesting before you know am I a tech guy or am I an old-fashioned guy to be honest I don't think I'm either I think yeah. old-fashioned or new guy, tech guys just want to know where that ball's going well, golf ultimately is about what the ball does and what did you score, as you golf, say. Golf is what the ball does. John Jacob said that years mm -hmm. ago. And I, I don't think, you know, the Trackman guys are brilliant. I mean, they are superb. But I don't think any guy standing on the range worrying about or standing on, the, on a par three on a golf course of the tournament pressure, trying to hit 4.5 degrees down on it and get the sweet spot to exit one left to get the ball up at 104 feet with it, they just want the thing to be starting on line, fading back towards the flag. It's, okay. you know, in, in my humble opinion, and, you know, th there are great coaches out there that work work a lot with, with Trapman and a lot with, you know, Radar. Um, and I, I do, you know, when I have the opportunity to, to do it, I do it. But it's more to me about what, that little number you put in the box at the at the end of a round. Well, you're using technology appropriately, and if it sheds a bit of light on things, great. But it's not but dominating. I, I, you know, again, my, my opinion for this is the technology is there for us as coaches, mm -hmm. because if we're then asked a question, we've got an answer. Good. I don't think it. I don't think a lot of the players are overly that interested. No. But I just think it's there if we're asked a question. 
Okay, Jen. So just kind of because time is flying by, and I do want to get into a little bit of your, your, your victories, um, David. But be, before we do that, I want to bring in our captain of the Lanks PGA, Neil Reeves. I mean, obviously, si, uh, David, sorry, you were successful in 2018. You, you won the Russian Open after eight starts and particularly good performance there because I think you only missed six greens in 54 holes. And then, of course, 2019, and as I say, with Simon helping you kind of between those events, you won the Sinclair in, uh, Invitational at Hanbury and then went on to win back-to-back, -back, as it were, with the Paris uh, legends. But prior to that, when we're talking about mental toughness and resilience, and I, I would like you to kind of shed a bit of light on your, your, your thing with um, Philip Price and Mike Slater and so on, you, you had the knockback where you, in 2017, you missed or lost in the playoff to get your card and how much. I'm going to ask Neil Reeves, our captain, to ask you a little bit about that and your resilience and your ability to ultimately bounce back. Hi, guys. Hi, Neil. Hi, Neil. Hi, Neil. All right, yeah, good. Um, yeah, first, I'd love to reiterate what Twist said. Thank you, guys, for uh, coming and doing something which is extra special for the Lancashire PGA. Um, Simon... Thanks very much, David. Awesome and, and Aid, you've been a superstar doing what you've done. Thank you very much from all of us. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Shackers, I'd like to ask you a question that obviously um, well documented uh, about um, losing, obviously in the playoff. I'm, I'm going to be blunt with this, and I want to know as a as as a fellow professional of yourselves to, to coach other people is how on earth did you come back from such a setback like that in, in this, in, when you knew what the stakes were going to be? Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, thanks for reminding me, Neil, first of all. Um, <laughs> but, no, it was, um, it's, it's funny, it's what, I think it's what you take out of it, to be honest. I, mean, I, I, I spoke with Adrian the other day, you know, uh, People sort of say you've got to learn to lose before you can win, but you, you've got to learn to win as well, haven't you? You know, um, and learning to lose is easy because you do it all the time, most of the time in golf. But to to the, the, the things I took away, ultimately, obviously, the, the, my, my underlying memory of it is, is the night in the hotel after, which was just something I would never ever wish on anybody. Um, horrendous. Horrendous to think that the whole thing's gone on, on the, you know, almost like on the flip of a coin type thing, or something, you know. But the, the one thing I did take from it more than anything was the stuff that me and Simon worked on. I went, I mean, I, as I said before, we would have 10 minutes here, 15 minutes here, 20 minutes here, whatever it might well be, over the 20 odd years that we've, we've, we've messed around in the region and done stuff. Um, but we played at Mia back end of the year and I said to him can we do something proper because I want to have a go um, yeah. and he then when I turned up at Windermere at the time basically said give me half an hour to talk to you got an idea and I said okay and we went with it and it, and it made sense it was slightly different things that I'd worked on all the time all the time I played but it made sense and we went with it and I remember standing in the fairway in the shot in the last three, and I just thought, as clear as day, do exactly what he told you. And I did it. And, it, and I thought I did the green, as it, ultimately the ball was spun in a trap and I made a bogey. And, you know, the rest is history as we say. But I come away from it thinking, I wouldn't have had that shot back. And I did exactly what I wanted to do in the most, for me, far more pressure there than, than, than trying to win something because your whole year's on it. And yeah. to me, it reiterated or, or strengthened my belief in that what we, what we were working on actually worked. It wasn't like okay. a strategic like, booked it out of bounds. I actually hit what I totally thought was a great shot. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have swapped it. But uh, I really would be in the, the year later when I... Two holes to play on the same golf course on the same two holes, or needed the same two fours. The yes. year later to get the card again, um, and and I genuinely did never want to feel that feeling again. And I just basically switched back into almost sort of coaching mode, 
you can do this every swing. You do it all the time. And, and I played almost swing for two holes. That, that's easy to hit it there. It's easy to hit it there. It's easy to get it to here. Hit it to here. Roll it up and knock it in. I know it makes Brilliant. it sound very simple. I mean, but, I, I, I think... From obviously from your achievements from from all of us probably watching this uh, uh, video tonight, you know we're so proud of you what you've done. It's just uh, brilliant for us all, you know, especially in the, in the Lancashire region. But I mean, you know, the comeback from from that, and I spoke to you a couple of times during that, and you know, the belief was still there, and uh, you know, it shows how strong you are, not only well, mentally yeah. but also physically, and it, and it, it it's been. You know, it's been a it's been a story that I've loved watching. You know, uh, you know, yeah, grow. It's, it's been so brilliant. Um, well, I mean, I'm looking at the screen here now, and I've I've got it where I can sort of see a few a few faces there, and and I'm looking at him now because when I came back, and I've and I've spoke about this in a couple of interviews I've done, I, I genuinely I hadn't realised myself how much it affected me, and I, I was, you know, for want of a better word, poor when I when I came home when I was playing in. Lancashire events, this, that, and the other, and um, it actually, I'll never forget, uh, and he, I'm looking at him now, with Mr. Duncan, and, my, and it might have been, God, it might have been back in July time, even, and he just said to me, one day I've done all right somewhere, I don't know where it was, or what it was, I can't honestly remember, but I vividly remember him saying, it's taken us six months to get the Shaq weed all back, and, and I thought, yeah. he's probably right, he's probably right, but I hadn't. You can't see that yourself. No. You know, it's, it's, how can I play now? Really can't. But you know, there's so many sides to it. Um, but the fear of failure got me in my card. Brilliant. The, the fear of having to go through it. I think again. Andy might want to speak there. Oh, I mean, it was. It was just. He, he turned up, and, and he just. He just wasn't himself, and he, he played in a few winter stuff, and. Uh, you could tell, and then this particular day, he was—he was—he played a good score, but he was back. He was—he was just the—he he was the old shack is um, giving me a bit of grief, and uh, I said, you, "It's nice to see you back, lad." And uh, on he went, and, and and made us all very proud. I, I must say that uh, Neil A. Richard has been great to watch um, what you've done, shackers, and uh, uh, and may Allah may it continue when we, we get over this uh, COVID thing, and you can get back out there and win a few more. Yeah, I mean, that's lovely to hear. It's lovely, you know, I've I've come, and Simon and all of you, you know, however long we've been in the counties and the regions, when anyone from your region, from way back when you first started, did any good, you followed it. You always followed it, whether it was qualifying for an Open or, a, or a, a playing at Wentworth or whatever it might well be, you genuinely rooted for them. Um, and and it was it was great to watch, and obviously nowadays it's far easier to watch with with all the internet and everything else. But for me personally, and for Simon for that matter as well, you know, I, I if I put something on, if, it, if it's a thank you, it's genuine heartfelt. You know, I mean, I'm not um, I'm not yeah. gonna I'm not, I'm not a brown nose. I never have been. Uh, what you see is what you get. But it's you know, I genuinely like. The support that people have given you. you know, so if I may interrupt you, um, David, yeah. um, just briefly without dwelling on the negatives, obviously during that period you literally got a job with UPS for two months and you yeah. kind of quietly yeah. went about your business, not mm. telling anybody what you did, but in terms no. of resilience and, and bounce back ability, which I think in an age where a lot of youngsters do, and parents want their youngsters to get on tour and they buy them, I always kind of like to take the, the mickey out of my young juniors when I tell them that their golf bag collectively costs more than my first house, just as about their parent is about to spend another 400 quid on a shaft or what have you. And from me, you know, you're now a bit more kind of, can we call it the secrets in the dirt or, and so on. And we go to the influences that, you know, on tour, when you've gone on tour now, you've got the kind of players that were, should we call them journeymen, club players, and there's many, so many good players in the audience here watching guys, other guys who've played in the Open and so on this evening, which is nice to see. But you've got the kind of players like Bob Cameron who've been kind of combining a club job and Paul Wesley and different, and Paul Streeter. 
And then you're rubbing shoulders with Paul Broadhurst, Peter Baker, Woozy, Sandy Lyle, John Daly, you know, Langer, Paul Hills, all these guys have won on tour. When you were victorious in Russia, at that point, like a lot of, we see on all tours, you thought, hey, I belong here now. I, I, I actually justifiably have earned my right to, to, to be here. I'm not, I'm not making up the numbers anymore. Yeah, I, I've got to be honest, I, I, I don't think, I think first event, you never know, you, you, you're trying to, I, I felt like I could probably suss it out fairly quick as to where, where I stood in it, you know, and where I felt like I was in relation to the other players um, in our first event. And I came away from that first one, I finished 18th and I played 27 poor holes and 27 good holes. Um, and... I thought, yeah, I fancy this out here. I think, I think I'm all right. Um, and I do, various things changed throughout the year. And Siren was always consistent with, you, you'll win one. Yeah. Um, and as much as I'd love to think about that, it's never been a way that I could definitely go into an event thinking that straight away. I was, I needed to find my feet, as it were. And, watch and learn and, and listen and, and play with them and the, and I found this probably, I know you've touched on it earlier, but when, when I first started having a go at the darts and getting a bit further up the ladder with the darts and playing with higher standard players, initially you're, you're nervous, you know, you're, worried, you're playing the person, you're, you know, someone you've watched and idolised on the TV and it's hard to sort of focus on you a little bit. It is distracting. And on that but note, you know, with being a, a very competent darts player and people don't realise, obviously during that period where you're a bit down, but you were playing the likes of Bristol and beating world champions and so on. I know he's going back to John Twist's question about nature or nurture. And I know your dad wasn't necessarily a super proficient golfer, but you are obviously a very good snooker player, a very good darts player, an exceptional darts player. And at that point, you didn't question you, your ability with your golf. You knew you were going to be back, as it were. Yeah. It was more, it's not questionability. It's just being able to, I'm not going to say no, but almost ignore the fact that it's Woozy or yeah. Langer or Brody or whoever they are. But the minute I, I got to know them, and, and that's probably their own fault for getting friendly with him, being encouraging and all the rest of it, suddenly there's mate. It's then I just want to crush you into the floor whenever I get a golf club in the hand. And, and I thought, yeah, that goes good for me. And, and so very quickly, yeah, and I just want to kind of scoot through things here because I've also got some gents who've asked questions. We've, we've got Dave Corby asked about um, stats and um, um, Craig Lee also about you getting it over the line. And there's no doubt about it from your competitiveness. That is kind of probably your mental toughness is possibly one of your, you know, you say you're not as focused, should we say, on the swing or how it looks, but more about getting the job done. You, we mentioned when we chatted today about, say, the irrepressible Mike Slater and also what Philip oh, Price yeah. said to you and Woozy's help. Could you elaborate on that kind of being accepted um, by the likes of Mike and Philip Price and, and so on? Yeah, well, it means, it means a lot, obviously, it means a lot. You know, these are people that you look up to. But, you know, when I first started, as I said to you the other night, you know, I remember reading the, the irrepressible Mike Slater in the, in the, the yearbook, thinking, well, oh, must have wanted to write that about me one day. You know, and, and, I, and I genuinely, I've always remembered that. And, you know, Mike was great, great with me and, and helped me. when I, I didn't say a lot of Mike, but he helped me. Um, and... Like, like you say before, I mean, they, they, they genuinely love golf, some of these great players, and they love to talk about it. I mean, Simon came down to uh, Hanbury the week that I won the second time, and we had a, we had, uh, a full day down with Ollie, and we, we, we put our time in on the range, of course we did, we, you know, we did it properly, um, after a very hearty breakfast, I might. Um, <laughs> and then... You know, when I turn around for five minutes, you know, look away for five seconds and turn back around, and he's he's giving Woozy a shipping lesson. You know, and, and that's how it is. He, he's 
he's he knows what he's talking about and it becomes blatantly obvious that somebody like Woozy appreciates and loves to talk about it and, and they love to to, to banter and golf stuff around so they will like that point it. of view you, you, you spoke sorry about Woozy you know asking you about a club and that developing into something yeah yeah I ended up as me having a go of his wedge because he was try that what do you think of this I've been grinding so long this one and I bent this one to that and within three or four shots he just said to me how are you trying to play it and next thing oh you want to try it like this and an hour and a half later you know I'm walking away in a bit of a daze thinking has that really just happened but but that's what they're like you know they're, they're genuinely and I'm not just saying this there's, there's I can't think of anybody that isn't like that out there they're, they're, they're amazing and they, because they love golf and for both for both of you, there is a question um, briefly, Simon. I want to just come back to this before we kind of run out of time. Then I'm going to come back to you, um, Dave, if I may. But I think this one was um, from maybe Chris Todd. I'm just reading. So, David, that was one. Uh, with, with the potential revamp of the tours once they resume, following your experience of the world's first mixed ever event in Jordan, do you think the, sh the tours should try and establish a few mixed events this season. For Simon, when it comes to coaching, David, do you use stats? We've asked about this, Paul. Or do you prefer uh, a feel or, uh, sorry, excuse me, feel or technique style of coaching? So I think we've kind of covered that one. I think, that, I think to, answer, to answer that question briefly for you, for uh, whoever answered the question, I, I think the one thing that, that Dave got, David got really, really good at was sticking to a process. That's where he got really, really good. Once he understood the plan and he understood the part of the process that we were going to do to get into where he's got now, where he will continue to be in and, and constantly improve. I think the, the reason why he went, he, he went, he's won, and I knew, and I, I knew at Hanbury Manor the day after the Pro-Am that he'd go very close if he, not, if he didn't win. And I said to my boy in the car coming home that night, that he'll win this week because he, he had it on a string round Hanbury. It was just ridiculous. Everything I asked him to do, he did. And the process was there. And, you know, he, he's always been mentally brilliant. So whether it's a feel or a technique, it's a bit of both. And do you, you think know, I, I kind of, I, I kind of sometimes, obviously, us coach or uh, the, us with the feet in the coaches camp, we're always looking for more information and there's so much stuff out there. And then, I relate back to John Jacobs sometimes and, and he, he spoke to, well, he told me about a lesson he gave Peter Thompson and he said, why didn't Thompson write a golf book? And he said, well, there's nothing to write. All you do is kind of hold it, swing it back and hit it. So how much more complicated do you want yeah. it to be? And you think, you know, again, it's horses for courses. How Bubba works is different than how Deshambo works and that's golf. But they're all trying to do one thing. Yeah. You know, we, we we're trying to hit a round object with a flat surface with varying degrees of loft up, yep. you know, and we're trying to make the ball go in a straight line. Jim Flick always said to us, he said, great golf and great instruction are, are the same thing. It's about subtraction, not about addition. It's about taking away the variables that you don't actually need and making the game as simple as you can do it. Because when everybody's played great, everybody said, well, that was easy today. It was simple. It was easy. I was relaxed. Blah, blah, blah. So it's not about, you know, giving a player a multitude of information. It's giving them the right amount of information for what they need right. and what they ask for. That's, that's the most important thing because at the end of the day, they're in charge. No matter how good or important we think we are as coaches, we are there to serve the player. We're not there for our own ego. And I think that's where... As a, that's as where a, I've been going as, wrong. As a... As a half-decent player, I think you understand that. Mm. You know, coming from a, a, a half-decent playing background, I think you understand that it's not about the coach. It's no, about, you've got, it's there's always got to about be that, that empathy. And I do want to ask you both a, 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 an uh, some sort it's of It's not question. about empathy. Oh, we... He's the boss. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I, I do want to ask you some, like... both about advice. But before that, David, just about... Um, obviously, you played the Champions Tour event in Morocco, but unfortunately, and you played with John Daly, unfortunately, you, you sustained that wrist injury or that tendon by, I think, hitting a rope and, and yeah. didn't allow you to 
prepare and play as well. But if you're kind of looking at your future, when ultimately all this passes, and I know depending with your, your um, category, your, your exemption to these other majors, and we'll have to see how that goes. But in terms of hierarchy or importance to you, would winning the seniors open, you know, along with the likes of Langer and, and, and such great names, or you having success on, say, the Champions Tour, like a lot of Roger Chapman and these guys and some of the guys in and Monty and, gone on to the, and, and Langer gone on to the US to be very successful. How do you see, or have you got a preference? What would be your goal? Well, I, I'm like I think any any other sort of Brit. You'd have to you, you put your home open, um, and I would also say that's probably my best ever chance would be at home. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I had a little taste of last year at uh, Oak Hill, which you know, I, unfortunately, I wasn't playing great, but um, you know, you, you realise that that was rough. Like I'd never seen it, even though it wasn't the eye. It was just something that I'd never ever seen. Um, and I hopefully if the if the exemption categories carry to next year because it's not looking great for this year at the moment as regards a full schedule, then then I'll I'll get another few goals out there at US opening things. And I'm looking forward to having another goal. But forewarned is forearmed, you know, it's it, it's yeah, experience. And, and, and that's the great. biggest thing. Yeah. Do you I, think I, having... I would pick our would pick ours first. Definitely. Your home open. And having played now, I mean, obviously you've played with Brody in, in Cheats events and things like that, and Peter Bake and so on, but having kind of seen many of these, what historically you might have seen these guys on television before, or, or kind of, or when you played in the open and so on and admired them, should we say, from a distance, and now you're, you're part of the club, you're the man, you've won three times and they have respect for you. Obviously you equally have that respect for them. Is there any players that you've thought, wow, or do you still think, hey, I can I can beat this guy. I've I've got the tools. I I can get it round without being arrogant. Just having that inner inner self belief. I think, I think of all the of all the people that I've sort of I've been lucky enough to be around in the, in the years I've been out there. You, you can't help but just marvel at Langer. You, you just can't. It's just ridiculous. Um, just how good he is and how old he is for that matter at the same time. Um, you know, he's he, how fit and committed he is still oh, mentally and physically. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's, just, he's the same size waist apparently as he was when he was on tour. Um, you know, all that, when he first came out, he, he's mm. no different. Physically, he looks stronger if anything. Um, but to be able to sort of to stand on the range, you do sometimes catch yourself just watching, you know, standing next to Goose and watching him hit shots and think, oh. That's pretty. It's not one that you've had for career, you know. About one or two, you think, yeah. These guys are special. One or two like that. But, and a but question. At the same time, you know. Sorry. Well, Carry on, no, please. Well, I always think, and Simon would be the first to say this as well, and, and his mentality is exactly the same. They're all beatable. Great. They're all the, at the end of the day. You know, they're all humans, they're kind of ordinary people doing extraordinary things, and now you're one of them. Yeah, um, they, can't, they can't alter, they can't do anything with your golf ball, you can only do what they do. Yeah. You know, and if, if you play the game, there's only the only person that can affect what you do is you, really. So, you know, if, if, you, can, if you can control all the various different things that go through your mind when in the situations, you know, and learn how to do it. Uh, that's that's a big part of what these guys have done, regardless of being super talented as well. And very quickly, guys, just before we kind of cl close up, because time is going to, and if we do all of a sudden get cut off, my apologies in advance, but for both of you, kind of giving advice to the, the younger people in the audience and, 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 and so on. My old boss used to say to me, if you can't beat everybody in your own backyard, you shouldn't bother going on tour that's possibly slightly different these days because you've got people walk a cup and so on have got a great international careers but then you've got say other players you know your Poulters your Matt Wallaces of you they don't hear of and all of a sudden they're, they're on the radar for young players both Simon and yourself Dave 
in terms of qualities that they need is temperament. John Jacobs said temperament is more important than technique to me. And that's the biggest technique guy on the kind of planet that was, you know, obviously. And how much, I know it's slightly different on the seniors tour, but power and short game and what, what hierarchy, uh, how do you guys see both the game now and, and, and moving forward if you're a young player and you want to progress and make it and have aspirations? What, what, what do you think is the formula, if there is one? In my, well, well, I think I think it, it's you could talk about this for days, but a great attitude will be will beat a great golf swing most of the time. As a as a start point, um, anybody that's going out there with a, a great attitude day in day out will generally do very very well. Um, work incredibly hard. I mean, get get a plan together, get a coach together, get a plan together, and just work harder than anybody else is working. And from a technical point of view, you know, there's, there's two things, you know, where the game's developed now. It's it's all about distance and it's all about short game. You know, if you put, chip and put great, you're great from inside 50 yards and you hit it as far as you can. You know, Tiger, Tiger, he said he, you know, when he, he was growing up, his dad told him two things. He said, hit it out the middle of the club face and make sure that every swing you're in balance. If you can do both of those, you're going to hit it a long way. Mm. And Dave? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think, um, I, I look at the, the way the game plays now, obviously it's totally different to, to when I started um, and a lot of the boomers started, but there was always people who hit it a long way, those people who were renowned for short game, you know, you've got to, I think you've got to find where you're good at and then, and then work on the bits that you're not. But you've, but you've never take any of it for granted. And, and as I said to you before, you know, I'd spend a lot of time, a, a lot of the lads on the tour will probably say, you know, his short game's unbelievable. You know, at which point I turn around and go, you want to see my, my mate Simon do it? You know, he makes me look daft. Um, but it, the, the thing is, I was never really that scared of asking. And I remember playing Eelsey years of my, my one of my first ever things, I think he was at, at Olmsker, I played him in the match play, Lancashire match play, and he duffed me up four and two around my own track. Um, but I'd gone in there and opened the shop up with the fire, the wood and the coal. And I remember seeing balls out the window of the shop thinking, who the bloody hell's eating balls at this time of the morning? And it was Ilsey warming up. And I'd never seen that before, ever. He was, um, he was probably hitting bunker shots like that one of your turns reach against me. Yeah. Yeah, the one I said he'd won the tournament, yeah. And, yeah. and I, <laughs> I, I came out the shop. I came out the shop with my bag and he said, yeah, you know, do you want to have a put? And I said, no, I'll be all right, come on. And, I, and I birded the first hole, I'll never forget it. And I've not, I've not had a shot. Um, I remember thinking, yeah, how many balls have you hit? Anyway, needless to say, he well and truly dispatched me four and two. But I, I basically, the last 16, 17, 18, I, I just I, I spoke to him and chatted to him and he was an approachable guy. Um, and he knew more than I did, and I asked, and, and I made a point, you know, if I if I had any kind of inkling of respect for anyone and who'd done stuff, I'd ask them stuff, and I never ever felt like I knew knew it all, because you never do, you never stop learning, I never stop, I, I'm still the same now, and you can... No, and you I can think be... those qualities are obviously the, what make you so popular and affable that you, you can play the game, but you're going back to Mike Slater, you're irrepressible and you've maybe classed as a man of the people. I think probably uh, everybody in the audience you know, might agree. It's something I've learnt off people that I've looked up to and, and you know, you know, generally they're, they're, they're approachable and, and if you listen, you learn. I mean, I've learned so much off Simon. He, you know, he, he knows so much more about a golf swing than I ever know. Um, and ways to teach people that I've seen that the old Bruff story that we said very briefly Yes, if you'd completely yeah. flubbed your mind to stop you thinking about stuff. Um, you know, asking me what colour boxer shorts I had on, on, on a yeah. lesson. You know, I mean, I, and, and I said to him, what, what are you on about? What are you on about? And he just said, I just wondered, you know, what colour they were. And he, was in a bad, he was in a bad place and I was breaking his pattern because he was moaning. Yeah. I had to do something. something I, never I, was, yeah. I thought it was just, <laughs> I, thought I, I was actually waiting for the rest of the North Region lads to come running out the bushes like a Jeremy Beadle moment. <laughs> Didn't you win that way? I, I was near. I don't know whether I won or not. But, you know, it was, 
Well, strangest just, situations I've ever been in. Just um, going back to um, the, the seniors tour and playing, obviously, with the Ryder Cup legends, and you've got, obviously, Philip Price uh, leading this year. What was, I know we spoke the other day and you were talking about Price's comments about you, you know, and you played with him, and obviously he's a great player. And I watched him once, and he had the greatest shot I've ever seen out of the bunker at the Belfry with a five iron over the water for the tenth. Unbelievable. But you tell me about what he'd said about you, um, Dave, if you would. Yeah, well, it was Louis at, um, at Harlot that told me. I mean, I, you know, we, me and Simon both went there, and I got fitted for me. Um, I've known Gareth from the Harlot Pro Am for years and got on great with him. He's such a lovely fellow. And uh, he just, we went up the last time we went, actually, it would have been. Um, and I played with Pricey and Doddy in the last round in Russia when I won. And, uh, and he, he just said to me, I just thought you'd like to know that he was down here with his son. He was playing in, a, in a, an amateur event. And he just, your name cropped up. And he just said, yeah, he's one of the hardest men I've ever met on a golf course. And, and I thought, he said, I thought you'd like to hear that from someone of his calibre. Uh, you know, he, he knew you weren't going to fold on him. And I, and I thought, well, yeah, yeah, you probably, you know, and it was, it's a hell of a boost mentally to you that you think. Well, oh, that's, that's something, sorry to interrupt, mate, that's something you said earlier on. It's, it's, everybody talks about you only learn from failure. You, you learn as much from winning as you do from losing. And, you know, you had a, You've always had a great mentality about winning. You, you've always wanted to win because that's what the game's all about. You know, you and I are, are very similar. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, winning's a great habit. Winning's a, a brilliant, brilliant habit. No matter what level that you're playing golf at, if, you know, you learn to win early. You're going to be, you're going to be golden. Oh, so listen, some of the greatest times we had were, were when we were. We used to compare how many under par we were for the year on the North Region and who'd won the most times. And we were getting into the 20s for a season. You know, I remember 23 and he's won 22. You know, because he was the same. He was a winner. We, we, just a quick one. We, we remember when we played in the uh, the four ball event in Spain that we won the PJs of Europe as was their, their <laughs> four ball championship. And we yeah. were so far ahead after, I think it was 63 holes. We were going after every flag to try and we had a competition, we had a bet who could get on the card the most times in the last round. You know, yeah, it was just some of the stuff yeah. we used to do. And that's that's right. obviously a great sign of confidence. That takes me to your practice regime. And I had a few questions about stats and so on, Dave, briefly. But you talked about playing with Paul Streeter and playing for birdies. And yeah. you briefly just cover that. Yeah, well, I've never, I've never been a real fan of practice rounds as such. I got a bit bored. Um, so we, we came up, we devised a theory where we would play our first ball out and a birdie was a birdie and whoever had the most birdies in the round won that day and we would do it throughout the year. We had every practice round together anyway um, and it, it, it made us, you, you, I felt like a little more means because I was trying on one put as it been as if it was in general play. Um, and then once you hit that putt, whether it went in or not, then do chipping, putting, whatever, you know, and try and learn the golf course. But you were always still, I always still came away with the feeling that we were at, we were competitive and we were learning pace and line. But you were kind of in modern parlance these days because nothing's new in golf, really. They talked about simulating yeah, yeah. game like conditions. You were, you're card and pencil stuff playing for birdies with that first ball and then chipping and putting with your second ball and so on yeah yeah and I think uh, it, because it, it stuck us for something you know and it gives you a little bit of banter and all the rest of it, it and it's just throughout the season uh, oh every single every single practice round yeah, yeah. Great stuff well gentlemen we're getting very close um, to probably running out of time and I, I, I'm going to unmute Andy and, and uh, Captain Neil and um, if I can find him on the list. I do want to thank you for your contribution um, this evening. And again, I, I reiterate giving you time freely. Could you, I'm sure that when we spoke the other day, 
uh, Dave and Si, I, I could have talked for hours. You had so many great stories. But I do want to thank you and everybody while we're on. We have hope we've got a great lineup with Paul Eels and Paul Affleck and Howard Bennett and Mike Walker, Phil Kenyon, Carl Morris. Graham Walker, some some stellar guys, and hopefully, dis whether we're back to golf, obviously tomorrow, we, we still want to continue these. And I am recording this, and it will be available. But thank you both very, very much. I know we've only touched the iceberg there. There's just so much to to um, cover. But if I could bring in yourself, Neil. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd like to also thank everyone who's participated, all the the viewers to this event. So obviously, it is the first uh, of, of a, a few events that uh, Adrian and uh, the, the Langs PGA are running. Uh, but um, thanks for everyone to taking time out of the busy schedule because we know how busy you're all going to be tomorrow. Yeah. You're all going to be either in that shop, you're going to be uh, on the range, hopefully for some of you, and obviously, hopefully we can get golf back to some sort of normality. But really, thank you for watching what we've done today. And uh, Simon, uh, David, brilliant. Absolutely in enjoyed it more than I thought I would. Thank you very much for your insights into, obviously, a, a player and coach's role. And once again, Adrian, thank you very much for doing what you're doing. You're as awesome as everybody. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, and I'll just, um, I'll, I'll copy that, uh, guys. Uh, you've been fantastic. Just a little last note, David. I know that... Uh, you're the second most requested professional by the teams in pro -Ams. You're only second to, to Johnny Cheetah, mate. So, you yeah. know, keep, <laughs> keep, <on going. laughs> keep trying, son. Keep trying. All right. But thank you, Adrian. Thanks, everybody. Simon, David, you've all been great. I'll, I'll send out details for the next one, next couple of days. But good luck and, uh, and stay patient tomorrow with, with all your members, guys. Well done, no, just bring well you done. bring you in, um, uh, Simon and and David, please, just to close off and thanks. You know, if you want to just say a little word, that I do appreciate it. Just everybody, you know, it's nice that golf's now back on the horizon. I think we've got to be patient with you know ourselves and with our golf clubs and with our fellow members. And uh, there is definitely going to be a new normal. But hopefully we'll all be back playing golf sooner rather than later. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to have been with you guys tonight. And uh, if anybody, you know, needs any help in the future, please give me a call. Well done, Simon. Well done. Thank you. I know Donald's here. He said he's ready to give us a song there, Dave. But I'm, I'm going to let you have a word first, please. <laughs> Don't let him play us out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's great, Donald. I, I really enjoyed meeting up with him actually in Austria last year. It's a shame. Well, hopefully we might still get there this year. I don't know. But um, I'd just like to say exactly why everyone else is. I mean, it's great that to, to see, you know, Lancashire PGA and, and the lads all tuning in and, and taking it down a completely different route. You know, it, it, just the strength in this sort of, you know, in the PGA and amongst us all it's, it's great and, and the support that people have given me and the comments people give me the help that Simon gives me and, and everything that's gone on with this so I hope it carries on because it's you know I've enjoyed doing this but I equally I'd, uh, I'd, you know, I'd love to listen to what everyone else has got to say and what, what future people say because I think it's a great thing and, and that's largely down to you Adrian so thanks very much for that as well You're welcome and um... So thanks, gents. I'm going to close the, the meeting here. Uh, as I say, we've got a great lineup. It's just a question of the timing of that now. In you know, once as I say, there's going to be a madness of Lensu tomorrow uh, for many of us. But again, thank you very much. I will do the recording and make it available to everybody and anybody else who missed it and possibly ultimately on the PGA website. So thanks again, ladies and gentlemen, and stay safe and enjoy getting back to golf. Thank you. Thanks, boys. <laughs>